Darling Grace, by the time you read this, I hope to be somewhere well beyond the coast of France as part of the Liberation Forces. With the invasion now underway, we truly believe the tide is at last turning in our favor. But the going is tough, and I constantly think of you and all the folks at home as a way of keeping my spirits as buoyant as possible. The words on the other side of this page were written down during the hours before the invasion began as a way of distracting myself from the agonizing wait before we were notified that D-Day had at last arrived. They are by another islander in the platoon, a guy named Wesley. Before the war, he worked on a trawler out of Port Alberni until he got into a rhubarb with the owner over his share of the earnings and stormed off to the local recruiting office. A bit temperamental, you might say, but quite the wordsmith, I'm sure you'll agree. During our rare quiet moments, he plays this song on a concertina he won in a poker game while we were crossing the Atlantic. He's also quite the comedian. You should hear his impersonation of CBC Radio News reader Lorne Green. It's a real hoot. As for the song, it's no secret that I can't carry a tune, so I only sing these words silently to myself. The boys here don't call me Tone Deaf Tony for nothing, you know. In my own mind, I imagine your glee club singing these lines. I know the words might seem kind of corny and sentimental, but Wesley has expressed exactly what I feel about home, and I wanted you to know that, just in case. I'm wondering if the Harmonettes might consider performing the song at the Harvest Hootenanny. The famous cowboy melody Wesley borrowed will be familiar to everyone. I know it won't be easy, but here's hoping you can convince Mrs. Benson to at least consider the idea. You know me, I wouldn't want to seem overly pushy on the matter. Just tell her it would mean an awful lot to a couple of fellows in uniform so far away from home. Gosh, I'm already just about out of space. I must learn to write smaller. Think of me amoureusement as I do my bit to liberate France. Perhaps we could visit the City of Light together when this blankety-blank war is over. Maybe we could even get a studio on the left bank where I could do some painting. You won't be surprised to hear that I haven't picked up a brush since that seascape I did of French Beach shortly before I shipped out. French Beach, how ironic. Little did I know at the time that I would one day be storming a French beach as part of a military operation. But of course, the painting I think of more than any other is my portrait of you wearing that splendid emerald dress your mother made. Sweetheart, that was a true labor of love. I can picture it so clearly in my mind as I write these words. Your loving soldier boy, Tony. shores and the gulls wheel and spin in the spray home home by the sea Peaks rise to kiss infinite skies. I drift off in a heavenly dream. Home, home by the sea, where the seals and the sea lions play, where the Douglas fir grows, where the tide ebbs and flows, and the gulls wheel and spin in the spray. As twilight 
night draws near as the sun disappears I fall on my knees and I pray For I know I belong where the wind sings its song How I yearn to return there someday Wesley looked me up after he returned to the island a few months after the war ended. He answered my questions about the circumstances of Tony's death from a sniper's bullet less than a week after he sent me that last letter. I appreciated Wesley's candor and forthrightness. He didn't mince words or try to soften the story. We met again at the Remembrance Day ceremony in Victoria in 1947 shortly after I had finished nursing school and was about to start working at the Royal Jubilee Hospital. Our first real date was the Old Fox Cinema where we saw Easter Parade. That was the first time I ever felt truly light-hearted again. I guess you could say In Your Easter Bonnet became our song. In your Easter bonnet with all the frills upon it you'll be the grandest fellow in the easter parade wesley was a good dancer which certainly helped to win me over he didn't rush me but gradually one thing led to another and we eventually got married on august 25th 1949 the fifth anniversary of the liberation of paris we had almost 45 years together, most of them happy ones. I guess it's just one of those quirks of fate that the only two men I ever loved should have died on the same day, namely June 14th, exactly 50 years apart. One from a bullet through the neck, the other from a heart attack while watching television reports of the riot that broke out in downtown Vancouver after the Canucks lost the seventh game of the Stanley Cup playoffs. I can't believe what I'm seeing he said, as a car was being turned upside down. Some idiot tried to walk along the trolley bus line and fell to the ground. The ambulance had trouble getting through the crowd to reach him. This is madness. There were tears in Wesley's eyes. I patted him on the head and said, maybe you should turn it off. I'm going to the beach to watch the sunset. When I returned, just over an hour later, Wesley was slumped awkwardly on the Chesterfield. The remote control clutched in his hand. I muted the sound and called the ambulance. But after all my years as a nurse, I knew Wesley was already gone. Just like that. I held his hand and sat in silence, staring at the images of thousands of hooligans, some of them in team jerseys, rampaging through the downtown streets, gleefully violating their own city. I'm on my way back to the island now, after spending the August long weekend on the mainland with my youngest daughter, Ella. We have booked a trip together to France. At my request, she has been in contact with the Royal Canadian Legion and found the war cemetery where Tony is buried and the exact location of his grave. I've decided that instead of flowers, I'm going to place a paintbrush next to his headstone, if that's permitted, of course. And then we'll spend a whole week in Paris. Ella, the family francophile, has already booked us a room in a boutique hotel on the left bank, in a street where Picasso once lived. Imagine that! The timing is perfect. We will be in the City of Light for the 50th anniversary of the liberation. 
I know already that I'll shed a tear for both my dead soldier boy and his army buddy who became my husband. After all these years, it will be rather bittersweet, certainly. But I am determined not to be all weepy and maudlin about it. Au contraire, I shall will myself to be grateful. Paris, Paris, at long last. In my heart of hearts, I think it's going to be quite magnificent. No, make that magnifique. Why does everything sound so much more romantic in French? We're going to hold a celebration of life for Wesley after our trip to France in September at the turn of the season. Ella will sing Home by the Sea, and then will scatter his ashes in Goldstream River and let the current carry them away into Saanich Inlet. A wish he expressed whenever the Beaujolais kicked in. That was the poet in him, I suppose, fantasizing about his own funeral arrangements. And if that's good enough for Wesley, it'll be good enough for me when my time comes.' 